Imagine a world where you knew that you mattered and you belonged. The people cared about you because we were so darn good at listening to one another, no matter how different we are. That is what Sidewalk Talk is doing by putting listeners on sidewalks all over the world so that we can practice the art of connecting. Join me, founder and director Tracy Rubel, as I interview experts on the fine art of human connection and interview some of our volunteers who've been listening on the sidewalk and even some of the folks that we've listened to. And if you want to volunteer, consider joining us at sidewalk-talk.org. I am really excited to introduce you to a friend of mine, Yamini Naidu. I met her at Jonathan Field's home and she was so quiet and curious and asked so many questions. And meanwhile, she's this diamond of information about business storytelling. And then when she told me that she'd written all these books and that she used to be an economist and then became an expert in the field of business storytelling, I'm like, what is that? And the way she showed up in her interactions modeled it more than anything. You know, business storytelling is not a ploy or a technique. It's a way of being in the business world that integrates more of who you are so that the workplace is more connective. And Yamini Naidu is a leading global expert in business storytelling and has written books about this because she came from this corporate life and has seen firsthand how when she goes into Fortune 500 companies and ASX 100 companies and teaches leaders and entrepreneurs how to use storytelling to connect, then you can serve the mission of the larger organization and then create a more connected, happy work culture. So I can't wait for you to hear this conversation. Join us. Yamini, I am so excited to ha- get to be in connection with you for these brief moments because I am just so convinced that you have so much to offer all of our Sidewalk Talk volunteers and, and all the folks that sort of follow us. Storytelling is your genius, but, but you have such an interesting background that got you here. How did you... How did you what is, how did you arrive here from being an economist to oh. leadership? Give, give me the, how did this happen? How, hi Tracy and hi to all our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. What a joy to be speaking with you. Uh, Tracy, uh, as, you, as you might've read in my bio and as you know, I'm an economist by training. Um, and for a long time, I was a senior leader on corporate Australia. And I was always frustrated with why data couldn't persuade people? We always had the logic, the business case, the return on investments, and we'll do, we would do these you know, dense PowerPoint-heavy presentations. We try and implement strategy. We would try and execute even small change. And it was always difficult. And our biggest stumbling block was always people. And one day on a long-haul flight, I got a copy of Stephen Denning's book called The Leader's Guide to Storytelling. And, you know, just even seeing the word storytelling and leader in the same context felt like an oxymoron, but I was desperate for answers. So on this long haul flight, I read, no, I devoured the book. And as soon as I came off the plane, I felt I was gasping for air and I rang so many leaders I knew and they, to ask them about this thing called storytelling in, in work. And they all said two things. They said, we know good leaders tell stories, but we don't know how to. And I continued, uh, you know, doing little um, market research groups with other leaders. And they all said both of those things. And I always knew I wanted to work for myself. And often the best way to learn something is to teach it. And when I looked, there was the one Harvard Business Review article that Denning had written and obviously the book. But nobody was actually teaching how you do this thing called storytelling. Mm -hmm. So just on that brave premise, seeing there was a gap in the market, this was something I was really excited about. Uh, I co-founded Australia's first storytelling company. So I'm talking way back from 2005. And just from that, it's grown. And my understanding, my practice, um, and the skills that I've you know, partnered and learned from clients and taught clients all over the world has also deepened. Okay, but not everybody would be on that plane gasping <laughs> after they read Denning's book. 
<laughs> that's why, right. That's why right. did you have that gasp? Like, what is it about who you are as a person that this took yeah. hold of your heart and you had to put this out into the world? I just, I felt a light bulb explode in my head because I felt mm. this was the missing link. So we're very focused on being linear, data-based, non-emotional, um, analytical, but that doesn't then speak to people's hearts and who they are. So it's almost like everything that we push out in terms of our business communication almost creates a disconnect, the very opposite of what we're actually trying to do when we communicate. Uh, so it just I just felt I was looking into an abyss, and this was the abyss of using you know, pure data, sticking with the facts, being quite tedious and boring uh, in our communication, whereas in connecting human to human, you talk to this, and this is something I've discovered through my work. So the book, I had a light bulb moment, and then after that, through my work, and this is something that I was listening to, your two previous podcasts, congratulations, really, really good job. And you were interviewing doctors Hendrik, Hendricks and Henderson, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even you talked about this idea of relational presence which is very much what your sidewalk talk volunteers do. You'll just have that relationship, relational presence. And I think in business, when we slow down and we invite and listen to people's stories, we literally stepping into that relation, relational presence. Um, Dr. Hendricks also talked about how, that, how we suspend, we need to suspend our own movies that are running all the time to tune in and mirror other people's movies. And I just thought that's exactly why storytelling works. Because the minute you're listening to someone's story, you suspend your own, you know, your own, uh, you just suspend all of that judgment, that uh, white noise in your own head, and you're totally focused on the other person. Mm -hmm. And so people who are sharing their stories feel really listened to. And this can be really powerful. And of course, Tracy, it's, you know, all of this has to be done authentically and with integrity. But just to go back a step, whenever I talk about storytelling, I'm, I'm very much focused on the area of business storytelling, which is storytelling with a purpose and for results. So that sort of so story, storytelling, as you know, is a vast field. And that's been the area that I've sort of niched and focused on. So I think, so, so I was thinking, you were saying what, what, what in it, what lit up inside me? And for me, I think it was, I was hungry. I was like, so they tell leaders, you know, you must connect with people, you must engage human to human, you must show emotion. But we don't necessarily have the tools. We don't know how to do that and do it well. So for me, storytelling just seemed to fill, fill all of that gap. Sorry, you go. Yeah. Well, so what I'm hearing you say is that there's this part of you that was hungry for a more authentic connection in the workplace. and storytelling actually allowed you to arrive there. But I guess the piece that I bump up against when I meet people who sit and I listen to on the sidewalk or in my own psychotherapy practice, they're like, I don't have time to connect with people in the workplace. What's the point? I just have to get stuff done. And how do you, how do you <laughs> speak to that? Or in, I, I, I imagine with all of the leaders that you train, you've got to hear this sometimes. Like, what's the point? I have to get stuff done. It almost sounds like exactly what I would say pre-storytelling when I was a leader. Uh, which is why you try to, you know, you try to pound through stuff. You're ticking the boxes. You're pushing out comms. But none of it is working. None yeah. of it is working. And what do we do, Tracy, when we push out data, we push out comms and it doesn't work? We tend to do more of the same. So we tend to do more of what is not working uh, in the futile hope that it will work. Uh, that is why earlier I was clarifying, I specialize in business storytelling, which is storytelling with a purpose and for results. But I also talk about these stories as being quite punchy, being short and sharp and having a message. Mm -hmm. So I never have a binary view. I never, I never say, oh, you can either get stuff done or you can tell stories. It's always seeing them as very complementary. So I was actually at a, at a conference a few weeks ago and a psychologist was presenting and he was saying one in four people in Australia suffer anxiety, one in four people. And then he stepped away from that big data point and he said, I remember when I was 18, I had my first anxiety attack and he shared a personal story. So that is how you're able to then do both. You're still able to get stuff done, whatever that looks like for you. 
But what the stories do is they help that stuff come alive. They help that stuff actually land with people because of that human connection piece. Um, I often think of stories as Velcro for people's brains. So that's mm-hmm. what people understand, remember, retell. And even you, when you be, you know, be talking about your side talk bo- uh, volunteers, that's what they remember. And that's why uh, what they do works because they provide that listening, that listening space. Right. Well, you know, it's funny because I get picked on by my husband and my sons all the time. They said, gosh, you have this big education. You studied mm-hmm. political science and history, but you remember very few dates. And I said, that's because there wasn't <laughs> enough storytelling in my classroom right. for me to remember <laughs> it. If you just have to memorize a bunch of bullet points, it doesn't stick, <laughs> which I agree. I know, absolutely, absolutely. But, yeah. I want to synthesize something you're saying because I think I'm getting something new here or something in me is deepening as I listen to you. Mm-hmm. I, I think that sometimes we vilify that productivity is bad and connection. Well, I know that I have vilified productivity is bad, connection is good, and I've split out mm-hmm. that binary. And what you're doing mm-hmm. is you're bringing them together. That no, Absolutely. we can be connected people at the same time that we're getting things done. But what I'm getting from what you're saying is that when we're storytelling, it's not about seeking attention. It's about being in connection with your audience. I love it. I think sometimes when we storytell, we're trying to, that's when I think bosses get annoyed and I don't want to listen to your story because you're just trying to, you're just seeking Mm. attention, which I might say, well, then you probably should give it to them because maybe they really need your Mm. attention. But Mm. I'm really hearing that it's not about seeking attention in the workplace and taking up a bunch of space, but creating connection and motivation and productivity in the story. Yeah. And how that binary view just hasn't served us. So when I work with leaders, sometimes I take them through, there's a very old model by Aristotle, the Greek Greek philosopher, Mm. where he says you need to have three things to influence. You need logos, which is the logic, the data, the facts and the figures, all of that. Mm -hmm. You need ethos, which is personal credibility. And this is so important. It's not positional credibility, it's personal credibility. And you need pathos. You need to create an emotional connection. Mm -hmm. And when you look at that model, so you've got three things. You've got logos, you've got ethos, you've got pathos. Mm -hmm. All of us in business, we focus all our attention on logos. Mm-hmm. So logos, the data, the case study, the facts and the figures, the procedures, the processes, the protocols. And when the logos doesn't work, we then try to do even more logos. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's really missing in our practice is ethos and pathos. Mm-hmm. So when you talk to leaders and you go, how can you fast track ethos, which is personal credibility and pathos, which is emotional connection. One of the ways in which you can do that in a way that's very authentic and purposeful is through storytelling. Tracy, I have to just give you an example at this point of one of the stories my one of my clients shared. Yeah. It'll just make it come alive. Yeah. Uh, so just I did some work with a large insurance company and one of my clients, Bernadette, she said, you know, my team's fabulous at what they do and they just punch through stuff. They punch through all the paperwork, all the, they were able to process um, everything very efficiently. But sometimes a piece of paperwork comes across our desk where we have to take a step back and pause. We might even have to ring the customer and say, can you tell me what happened? So she's giving, she wanted them to sometimes, whenever there's that ambiguity, when something doesn't fit, you've got to take a step back and pause. So that was the purpose of her, of her story. Take a step back and pause. And this, is the, that was a, and this is the story she shared. She said, a few weeks ago, my little five-year-old niece Maya came tearing into the house, holding an apple in each hand. And I thought, this is a good time. I'm going to teach Maya how to share. And I said, Maya, can I please have one of your apples? She quickly took a bite out of the apple in her right hand. And quick as a flash, she took a bite out of the apple in her left hand. I was shocked. But before I could say anything, she reached out with the apple in her left hand. And she said, auntie, have this one. It's sweeter. Mm. And I'm sharing this with you because every day we have that same opportunity. We can jump to conclusions, but every time we take a step back and pause Mm -hmm. and give people a second chance, imagine the difference we can make for our customers. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a story that a leader tells. Exactly. So this is a story that a leader mm-hmm. shared correct, with their team. Mm-hmm. Just to you know, you could you could say that just as a normal as part of your meeting. You go. It's really important sometimes when you know you get paperwork that doesn't fit. You ring up the customer. You take a step back and pause. But all of that is just like white noise, Tracy. It just mm-hmm. washes over. Mm-hmm. But a story like that, you know, will really stick. It helps people understand what you're saying. It helps them remember and retell. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then also the foundational piece. You know do the story stretch further into the personal ever? I mean, when is personal too personal? I had a client once tell me that when new employees came on at, at, at her startup, they would have them present four slides. And usually it was a slide of them as a child, a slide of them with, with whatever their version of family was, but it was four slides that told a story about them. So it was a chance for them to feel included or in, it was sort of kind of the way that they were brought into the fold. And I always thought, huh, that's interesting though. And how does that storytelling differ from the one that you're talking about? Cause it feels so personal and mm. maybe not everybody would want to do that in the workplace. So I'm just curious, I guess the question that I'm asking is how personal is too personal in your storytelling? Sure. I often, we often bump up against this and uh, it's, it's our biggest, one of our fears as well um, in business as leaders. I differentiate between personal and private. Mm. So even as a storyteller, there's a lot of personal stuff I share on stages all over the world and that's fine. But I'm very careful about what I consider private. And you as a storyteller, you get to decide. So this is an example. Sometimes I have clients who've been through um, quite serious life-threatening illness and they want to share the story of that and for me what helps us decide is the question I ask them is to you know and this is again from Oprah this is, uh, this is sort of um, you know cred- credit to Oprah where I ask them to say how does this serve the room so Oprah talks about how can I be of service so for them I say how does your story serve the room so how does it serve the audience and then we can make the appropriate decision so I think every story is to serve, obviously, you, the storyteller, your purpose. But most of all, it has to serve the audience. Um, and also being careful about where what you decide is private and then the private is a no-go zone. And what's personal uh, but appropriate for business, mm-hmm. wonderful to share. Like for me, even the little Apple story and her little niece, it's a little personal human touch that you can bring into the workplace. Mm-hmm. I, I, li- I liked the idea of the four, four slides. But also, I think as a new employee, I would it might be a little bit confronting for a few people. Yeah, for sure. And you also, I don't, you wouldn't want to be the only one sharing because then uh, you'd want to be in a group where everyone is sharing. So that might be another way of doing that. Yeah. And also, they get to decide because they're picking the photos, they're picking, you know, they're making those decisions, and yeah. Yeah. So, give me. One tip that I could employ to tell better stories as a leader. I think I told you before this call, I, I, I'm good at telling stories when I'm yucking it up over a pint with my friends. Uh, <laughs> but, but when it comes to writing a speech or writing a, an article, I tend to be very logos focused. Yeah, I don't know what happens, Tracy. It's almost like we flick a switch. And yeah. we go bang into Logos and we go, where is the person who was telling all those fabulous stories a minute ago? I want to bring them up. Uh, I think, and people want to see more authentic human version of all our leaders. And that is what the, you know, telling stories in personal stories allow, allows. My one tip for you, is what sometimes holds us back is when we don't know how to land a story. When we go, that's a great story. So my tip for you would be always think, what is the message? Mm-hmm. So, but, you know, for you, when you're designing your speech and you mm-hmm. say you've got a particular message where you go, I absolutely want my audience to walk away remembering that message, I would always anchor it in a story. Mm-hmm. So I would go on a little story safari. I would take out that message and it could be about courage or facing your fears or stepping up. Or, mm-hmm. uh, I would take that message out into my life and go, what personal story, you know, that I'm happy to say, share, so not a private story, allows me to really land that message for this audience. Mm-hmm. So that would be my tip for you, Tracy. So even the stories you share with your friends, think what could I bring into work that would land a message for me? Well, what you're saying is so deeply in alignment with connection because mm. 
what you're doing is you're bringing the connection into the foreground so that that story is about deepening your connection with the other rather than seeking attention for yourself. And that's what I find so profound about the way you talk about storytelling in particular. And then in the workplace, deepening connection with the other and deepening your connection to the organizational mission. And I just can imagine that when leaders are utilizing some of the ways that you're trying to help leaders get clarity around logos, ethos, and pathos, and really serve their, their, their audience, their constituents, their, their staff, that it makes it a more fun place to work too, because now you're connected into, I, I think it's the ultimate best workplace when we're actually getting stuff done, feeling really mission driven and feeling connected all at the same time. I mean, that's the sweet spot, right? And what you're describing in storytelling seems like the way when crafted carefully to make that happen. It's just beautiful. I just, I don't think I ever got it until I met you and another mm -hmm. friend of mine that does process storytelling. I am like, oh, <laughs> so it was always kind of a buzzword to me. I just didn't get it, you know? So yeah. tell people where they can learn more about storytelling and your work. Cause you know, Denny's book is not the only one out there now. You've yeah. written a few I've books got, on this. Couple, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, people can just find me online, either on LinkedIn or my website. So the spelling of my name and surname, yamininaidu.com.au. And we might be able to provide that as a link. Yep. You can also just search for me on Amazon. My latest book is called Story Mastery, How Leaders Supercharge Results with Business Storytelling. Um, so it's just been published in August of this year. Um, yeah, so th that's a little bit of how, what I do. And I think, uh, Tracy, just coming back to the point you made earlier, I just find that when I run my masterclasses or my workshops and I give people an opportunity to share and listen to other stories, they just, at the end of it, they just feel so alive. For the first time, they feel listened to, they feel heard, they turn to each other and say, I've been working with you for 10 years, but I never knew that about you. So it just mm -hmm. creates a space where we can go deep, but a safe space where we can go deep. And it's really rich and rewarding. And it's so good for our mental health or emotional health, all of the connection piece. Yeah, yeah. So I have another question for you that directly relates to what we're doing on the sidewalk. Yes. Is there a way when we're in the listener role that we can help move that person from logos to pathos to help have them feel more capable of moving beyond their logical mind into their connected storytelling mind. And it's, you know, to your earlier podcast, so one of your guests had talked about moving into curiosity. So obviously your volunteers are very good at the mirroring and then moving into curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know your process as thoroughly, obviously, as you would. But even stuff like, is there more? Or tell me more? Or how mm -hmm. did that make you feel? Mm -hmm. So moving, moving away from the logos, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes Tracy, even just really empathic listening, like I talk about, you know, in improv, they say, listen with your eyes. So you've got these wide, bright eyes. I'm looking directly at you, I'm making deep eye contact. I'm nodding. And sometimes even the silence allows people to go deeper. You've probably found that in your practice. Mm -hmm. Even that, you know, that uh, I call it, it's like this golden silence where I'm listening deeply. I'm not mm -hmm. rushing in with my opinion mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that allows people to drop more into the ethos and the pathos we tend to start off always with logos you know because we're meeting people for the first time there's that whole stranger danger there's a whole lot of stuff happening um, and then it's again that curiosity that empathy that tell me more or whatever you use I know you've got a few stem questions that you'll use mm -hmm. that'll definitely help people mm -hmm. yeah I just have so appreciated kind of getting to spend time with you. <laughs> oh, such a joy, Tracy, such a joy, a real pleasure. So we do this, we've started this new little tradition as we've interviewed more people along the way. And it's sweet. Um, we ask for a wish. And so I'm going to ask you for a wish for our volunteers on the sidewalk and a wish for Sidewalk Talk as an organization. What might you offer or a as a way of a wish 
for our volunteers and for the organization? Uh, I, I I wanted to I want I'll, I'll do my wish in a moment, but I just wanted to also just give you all the gift of gratitude. I think what you'll do is amazing. So first of all, we're all very grateful that Sidewalk Talk exists and you have wonderful volunteers. My wish for you is that you'd always continue listening with empathy and curiosity and love to all the people, all the people that you meet all over the world. My wish for your organization is, is always to do the work you do, but continue to do it authentically and well. And I don't know, Tracy, it's always that I want everybody to have access to you, but I also know that uh, scale is not always a good thing. So my wish is always for, for happiness, for con continuity, and for being grounded in what you do. And I hope for all your volunteers that every day you're, you're as rewarded, you, you receive as much as you give, if not more. Mm. Beautiful. I love that we were talking about scale. And I'm wishing for you that this book reaches all the exact right hearts and minds to change the connective qualities of organizations, because I think the work that you're doing could actually really impact someone's personal life, not just their professional life, if they feel more alive in the workplace. It just is so powerful to feel connected in the workplace. Wonderful. Thank you so much. What a glorious wish. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you for joining us today and spending a little bit of time with us. I feel like it's such a blessing to know you and to have gotten to have met you a year ago. And if you want to know more about Yamini, we'll have a link um, in, the, in the bio so you can find out more about her work and her books. And her name is Yamini. I remember the first time you met me, you already told the story. You said it's, it's like Harmony, but it's Yamini. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs a little tip, don't they? You know? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being here thank with us. Thank you so much. Tracy, thank you very much. It was such a joy. Thank you, listeners. Thank you for being here and listening to this episode of the Sidewalk Talk podcast. If you like what you heard, tell your friends, tell your family, like and comment on the podcast publisher that you're listening from, and subscribe. This will help us get the word out about changing our culture to one of connections.